Hello everyone, thank you for clicking on this video. This is Sean Weathers, and I am The Cinephile. Sam Peckinpah was an American film director and screenwriter known for his groundbreaking work in the Western genre. Born on February 21st, 1925 in Fresno, California, he gained fame for his distinct style characterized by graphic violence, moral ambiguity, and complex characters. Some of my favorite films from Peckinpah include Ride the High Country, which was a love letter to the Old West, The Wild Bunch, one of the greatest films ever made, Straw Dogs, which is timeless for its themes, The Getaway, a fun commercial action movie, Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia, very much a cult movie that I just love endlessly. I've seen it more than any other of his films. Cross of Iron and a few others that are, for me, stand out, but everyone has their own tastes and he has a lot to offer in his filmography. Peckinpah died on December 28th, 1984, leaving behind a legacy as one of the most influential filmmakers of his time. For those of you who love Peckinpah as much as I do, or for those of you who just are curious about this filmmaking legend, you're in for a treat. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. From 1993, Sam Peckinpah, Man of Iron. If you say Sam Peckinpah to me, I see a bullet going into somebody's body. I mean, that's what I associate with Sam Peckinpah. Not the Western or lyricism or anything else. I see <laughs> an advert for the National Rifle Association. I don't think there was a greater director in any respect, but it was flawed by his, his, his abuse of himself, of his abuse of, of, of his body, his, his paranoias and his fears, and, and, and spending so much time on his battling the powers that be rather than putting that energy on the screen. I mean, he would have been the most memorable director of the 20th century, I think, had his demons not taken over and destroyed him and his work. One of the best descriptions I ever read of Sam, some guy said he looked like a man who was stalking an animal much larger than himself. And that's the way Sam appeared to me. And I think that animal was violence. The Fellini line is that you have a journey in which you learn things about yourself that you just don't want to know. And uh, if you go deep enough, as Sam was going in, to you, you find out things that are not very pleasant to know and are very hard to, to deal with. And as I said, they're incredibly tiring and frightening. These are frightening people that he made movies about. And they're making them about himself and about me, and about you. <laughs> it's spooky. It's, uh, and I think he's genius. I don't think anybody's ever made a movie about a really, really bad man in which you love. You feel sorry for the character in M, and you feel, you know, these certain kind of dark side people. But this is, these are bad men, and you love them. The space in front of the camera was sacred to him, and he protected it. Man, if anybody violated that, they had a fighting tiger on their hands, you know. And uh, he could create an ambiance on the set like any I've ever seen. When you walked on, something's about to happen. Everybody, what is it, you know? <laughs> when is it going to erupt? That's the kind of feeling you had. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's that thing. It's, he was like Genghis Khan to the artist, with the artist. Follow me. You know, in other words, we knew we had a leader. Rice was uh, Sam's uh, great-grandfather, and he was a farmer and small merchant in Indiana, close to the Ohio River, right across the river from Kentucky. In the early 1850s, they made a family decision within the family to move to California. The train west was a family affair. It was a a seven or eight wagon train, incidentally pulled by oxen, which meant they moved considerably slower than the trains did with horses or mules. 
they decided to take what was known then as the Beckworth Cutoff, which uh, was a low-level crossing of the Sierra Nevada, and uh, they followed it, and it ended at Marysville, and they went on north into Humboldt County, and eventually farmed and got into the lumber business. And he chose this location and got a lot of his family to come, and they timber claimed, and they logged here in this area uh, for probably 20, 25 years. It's interesting to me that when the Peckinpahs came to California from Indiana, they spelled their name one way when they, when they left, and they spelled their name another way when they arrived. The mountain really became known as Peckinpah Mountain after my grandfather and Sam's grandfather logged up there for about 25 years. On the Forest Service maps uh, is a creek called Peckinpah Creek. The uh, meadow is called Peckinpah Meadow. But uh, the mountain on the map itself doesn't say Peckinpah, but it's known to the, to the natives as Peckinpah Mountain. And if you'll observe the U shape in the horizon up there, the V, the, the mill site and the meadow is about 300 yards directly east of that U. He was born in the valley at, uh, in Fresno and uh, attended Fresno schools, Fresno grammar schools, Fresno high school. And uh, Sam and his brother, Judge Denver Peckinpah, spent a great amount of time at the church ranch, which is uh, below, between Bass Lake and Fryant. And they grew up spending all the time, probably more times than they should, by staying out of school, cowboying and uh, branding and trapping and all, all sorts of things like that. One year, I remember shooting my third deer. He was at the edge of a bluff, maybe a hundred yards off. It was snowing. I was walking. I snuck a around a tamarack and shot him in the neck. When I circled around to where he was, he was half hanging over the edge, but still alive. And as I approached him, he watched me with a mixture of fear and resignation, and I wanted to say, I'm sorry. Because I didn't really mean to kill him. I, I got caught up in the chase. There was nothing I could do except pull his hindquarters away from the edge and put a bullet through his head to end his suffering. When that was done, I knelt down beside the carcass in the snow to gut it and found myself unable to control my tears. I'd had such an incredible communication with that animal. I'd have done anything to have seen him run again, but when you're really hunting, there's a relationship between a man and what he kills to eat that is absolutely locked. It's hard to explain to people who think that meat comes from their local grocery store or to those cats who come out and shoot anything that moves for trophies. But I cried that deer with more anguish than any other time in my life. I'm not familiar with any trouble that he got into. I know that his father was concerned about discipline and eventually uh, at one time in Sam's life after he got out of high school he, his dad sent him to a military school in San Rafael to help him get a hold of himself. made Sam unique as a Western director was his uh, tremendous encyclopedic knowledge of the West. Not that, uh, that Ford, you know, didn't have something 
similar, but I think that, that Sam was, you know, really a Westerner, and, uh, and he knew the West. Sam Peckinpah was a logical successor to Ford to take it the next logical step, not revisit it, but somebody who believes in those values and brings them into the 20th century. The Western, Dave Blassingame, the lone cowboy, the last American, whether he be an astronaut or a cowboy, a guy alone trying to find out what's the other side of the envelope. The guy with a dog he doesn't feed, which went on into uh, Hondo. And although people uh, clasp Louis L'Amour to their breast, Sam is really the original uh, spirit of all that. He wanted to keep the idea of the frontier going. The uh, Westerner in particular, you became aware of the, uh, the look of it, first of all, and then the, uh, the pace, the, the um, wonderful slow pace, Keith and the way he talked and went about his business, and uh, the lack of the romantic image of the West. There was a depth of understanding of that world. That world doesn't exist, and he was, die he was crying for that world to exist still like his grandpa in the old west and the men when men stood on their own and, and you know and would uh, develop the kind of men that's almost impossible to develop in an industrialized society see the west was a real kind of aberration onto the whole industrial east so to speak you know and the agricultural south it was not anything like that the west was a whole different trip that was still inhabited by grizzly bears and indians and everything else you know, and that was a, developed a different kind of man who was still an American. That was what he wanted. It was in this country. I think he saw what democracy was about was giving man more than anything else, giving man a chance to ex a common man, the lowly man, the uneducated man, any man who's a human being to express an individual spark in him and spirit in him, and don't mess with him too much. Rodney, you know what's on the back of a poor man when he dies? The clothes of pride. If you were to uh, really cast the, the Wild Bunch the right way, and you could get Jack Ford and Howard Hawks and Ralph Walsh and their youth, they'd have been the perfect characters for the Wild Bunch. They were the epitome of men who didn't talk about it but did it. You couldn't get them even to discuss their films. You know, they'd laugh at you and they'd make jokes and make an ass out of you. Um, so in a, and I think that element, that, that landscape, that drama of the end of the West, which is where Sam focuses in Ride the High Country, Dundee, Wild Bunch, you know, this is 1908, 1909. This is not 1870. Uh, this is not the making of the West. This is the end of it. Billy the Kid's script was written by uh, a beautiful writer, Rudy Wurlitzer. Uh, we both read the script and fell in love with it because it was a perfect script. It was poetic. It had the characters down pat, and it was enigmatic and beautiful. Well, this scene was a metaphor for the whole piece. It was a, a raft with a, a man who, on the thing shooting a bottle his kid was being uh, kids and there were three or four kids on the thing and uh, his wife and it was floating down the stream starts coming down the river and a man shooting at a bottle and so i take my rifle out and i make a shot and he looks up at me and he shoots at me and i get behind the tree and i shoot at him and he shoots back at me and then and then we both look at each other and he's floating down the river disappears down the river and it's this wonderful non sequitur beautifully photographed and everything that uh, that said more about the the whole thing you know of these people the whole mindset of of that time it was a beautiful thing and then he shoots at the bottle and we just let it go and it's a beautiful I mean because of that scene we both wanted to do the film they wouldn't let him shoot it so we had to go out on a day off under uh, pain of death, we could not divulge the secret, you know, that they were shooting. The whole crew went out and everybody did work for nothing and filmed uh, that scene on a day off under a cloak of secrecy, you know. To, to have to make a piece of art that way is ridiculous. The head of the studio, the chairman of the company, had a reputation for taking films away from 
directors and producers barged into my office uh, after he'd seen that and he said, what the hell was that scene about? And I said, well, Jim, that's a, a scene designed to really um, illustrate the existential sense of violence in the West. And he said, existential sense of violence? Get out of here. And I started to leave and I realized, wait, this is my office. I'd seen Ride the High Country and I'd seen Deadly Companions. I had never seen any of his television stuff, but the word was coming out there was somebody there who was picking up the Ford mantle and carrying the Western forward. And when you saw it, you realized this wasn't John Ford's country. This wasn't John Ford's Western. This was a more psychotic kind of place, you know. I mean, it, it was beautiful and it was elegiac, but it had something else in it, which I didn't recognize at the time was uh, rage and paranoia, but it, it, was, uh, it was new stuff. I don't know if, uh, you know, the, uh, the idea of uh, a non-violent man coming to terms with his own violence is necessarily uh, uh, a consistent theme in his films, but I think it's, uh, it's a consistent theme in, in his life. I think that that is a wonderful description of Sam. I think Sam's violence within himself came from his many experiences that he, he encountered during his life. Um, he was in the China Marines, he did, I believe, and I've only just recently learnt because someone's writing a book on his life and has talked to many of the Marines that he worked, that he w was with during, in, the chi in his China days, and apparently he observed some very horrific um, things that were going on there, and he, he, he was deeply troubled by them. There were a bunch of prisoners being dragged uh, to, to the jail, um, by wires that were attached to their genitals. And Sam absolutely had a fit and ran to his commanding officer and says, and said, you know, we've got to do something about this. And he said, Private Peckinpah, which is what he was, um, I'm afraid we're here just as observers and there's nothing we can do about it. And Sam was devastated and apparently spend all, spent all night outside the jail um, listening to the cries of, of the prisoners and never, ever forgot it. It's like they say in a bullfight yeah, to people who don't like the picadors, you know, it's part of the faena, it's part of the whole, the whole package, the, the ritual of it. And Sam's weaknesses were, were his strengths, I think. The uh, slow motion violence, you know, sometimes it was good, sometimes uh, it threatened what he was trying to do. I think it, uh, it, it came close to glorifying the thing that he was trying to, to uh, warn us about, I think. Sam was not dumb. He figured out what would make his material different from someone else's. Why would they hire Sam Peckinpah instead of John Ford, for instance? And action was the thing he thought he could do well and prove that he could do well, but it was not gratuitous. Uh, the Wild Bunch did, it, and if you can believe this, in the assembly, that eight-hour-plus job, uh, people were being disemboweled, heads blown off, arms flying in the air, and the, the audience, when I was watching it, would sit there and start to laugh. You start to titter, because the line between tragedy and comedy is very, very slight. And once you become a little bit thudded out of your mind with violence, it starts to get a little bit funny. And I think probably in that one, he finally realized that he had gone too far. Sam was the only director that I had worked with up until then and since then. They've killed a person the way they were supposed to die. While we were there, he had a special showing of the Wild Bunch in the downtown movie. And we all went, it was on a Sunday. I hadn't seen the picture. I watched him cut reel 15, which was the end of the big shootout in that picture while we were doing ballad. And so we all went to this little theater, sat down and watched The Wild Bunch, his cut, which very few people saw up until that, that point. And we walked out, and everybody was talking about it and, you know, whatnot, and I walked out alongside of Sam. And I said, 
Jesus Christ, you killed an awful lot of people in that thing. And I thought he was bloodthirsty. And he turned to me and he looked at me and he said very quietly, now they know what killing's all about. The Wild Bunch was both the, the apogee and the end of my romance with Sam Peckinpah as an auteur filmmaker. I thought the opening was absolutely breathtaking. You had never, we had never seen anything quite like that in its, in its stylization and its uh, choreography and its lyricism and its horror, all of that. And it seemed like a brilliant thing to start a film with a climax, <laughs> you know, start a film with the end. And then it was about this declension in which these people who had run out of historical time were going to be attenuated. And I was thoroughly and totally engrossed in the film all the way through. But when we got to the end and there was that shootout, I was, I, I thought, well, it, I thought it was pornography. But I subsequently decided that it was pathological <laughs> behavior. It was something in the, the filmmaker, the artist, extruding through the fabric of the, the material. It was like something had come up. You know, something had come up out of the picture and said, look at me. I made The Wild Bunch because I still believed in the Greek theory of catharsis, that by seeing this, we would be purged by pity and fear and get this out of our system. I was wrong. Sam really came back with a bang with The Wild Bunch. And uh, that in many ways, uh, what should have been uh, the beginning of a whole new career really turned out to be the end of a career in the sense that, uh, that he went mad. He went completely mad after the Wild Bunch. When he got all the attention that he got from Wild Bunch, he became self-conscious. I think he got over it by the time he got back to Pat Garrett in the Belly of the Kid. He was so on the outsides of the system that that was... Good. He liked that better. He liked being on the outside. But he was famous for a while there, and he hated it. Sam was conning Hollywood by supposedly playing by the rules when he had different origins. So he wouldn't say to them that he believed in a moral resolution with a gun down Main Street to get the bad guys. He'd say he's in psychoanalysis. The liberals love that here. And he'd say uh, uh, that... Harry Truman was the greatest underappreciated president this country ever had. So he sounded vaguely like uh, a liberal Democrat. And, uh, uh, and uh, so he was on the side of the angels. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, when he, when he wrote a script with you, he'd say, after the gunfighter gets shot in the back, let's make sure we, we uh, let the audience realize that the undertaker tries to take the gold out of his teeth before he buries him and let the undertaker do it in the shadow of the town church. He was in the tradition of telling the truth, but he wanted to make sure that uh, he didn't scare his masters out of hiring him, so he didn't stress or even acknowledge that his, his brother was the hanging judge of Bresno. Sam was uh, a lot of sham. Uh, I think uh, the fact that, uh, that he liked uh, things like noon wine and uh, like, uh, what's the Jason Robards? Uh, Ballad of Cable Hogue. Ba Ballad of Cable Hogue, I think, was his favorite film. And I think uh, that indicates that, you know, the, the, uh, the ones where the violence was, uh, was so emphasized, I think, uh, were not so much the real Sam, I think. Uh, they were uh, a persona that he took on. He had a lot of, uh, of real gentleness and love. He was a very, very uh, loving friend. He was very uh, affectionate with his friends. Apart from doing a, a lot of films together, um, Sam and I became very close personal friends. Um, we virtually lived in each other's pockets for the best part of 10 years. Um, even so much that at one point, I remember it was at the end of uh, Killer Elite, um, when Sam was planning his next film and he was talking about his doing it and uh, together and he said um, you know Garth you and I are married we're a couple we're married 
Well, I hadn't quite seen things this way, and, and I thought that if, if that was the case, it was probably time we had a divorce. And, and in oh. fact, I didn't do the next film with him. Um, though it didn't turn out to be a divorce, it turned out to be a separation, and in fact, we were a lot closer after that period than we had been before, probably. I've always thanked God I wasn't a woman who was in love with him. I loved him, but I'm so glad I was never the object of that kind of affection, because I think he was really brutal with women. Ah! No! The first time I met with Sam probably should have given me an inkling about what was the, the future had in store. He said, well, I've had all these women that uh, uh, wanted lunch breaks and had to have their hair done and their nails done, and I need someone to work. Are you ready to work? And I said, well, I suppose so. He said, well, go over there and type that. And it was the rape scene from Straw Dogs. It was quite a start. I mean, it sh I should have been a sort of uh, a, a little note in my head realizing what was to come. No! No! Much to all my better principles, where I said I would never mix uh, social life with work, uh, I'm afraid I succumbed about three weeks after the beginning of shooting. Women friends of mine were absolutely abused by him in the most unspeakable way. So I guess on that sense, I made Sam up without that part, since I was never the object of any of that male-female stuff. Like a lot of us, uh, Sam had a lot of bad examples, I think, you know, for how to treat women. And uh, I think Sam loved women deeply and was afraid of them and, and generally treated them the way Mexican men treat their women, you know, Sam had a real Mexican heart, and it's real backwards. We were in a whorehouse in, on Dundee in the middle of the night in Mexico, and this, he's with a woman, and, you know, they come and they sit next to you, and this woman's coughing with TB or something, and she's running off to see her baby, and I'm not saying a word to her all night, and finally she gets up to leave, and Sam turns to me, Son of a bitch, that's a human being sitting next to you. Uh, yeah, okay, <laughs> you know. His feminine side, his soft side was far, and I don't mean this in a homosexual sense. I just mean that, that Sam had a very, very strong feminine side, and I think it scared him to death, and he overreactively put a lid on it whenever he was aware enough to watch it sneak out. There was a very gentle feminine side, um, the side that um, probably had to do with his love of sunsets, with his, um, his love of poetry, his love of reading, his love of nature and changing weather, all of those things, which were not part of the normal image of, of Sam, the macho Western man. The scene where Carol and Doc McCoy sleep together for the first time since his prison sentence was really Sam and Steve at their most articulate. I mean, there was a lot of bravery, I recall. I recall it specifically with Steve um, making clear that the kind of energy that would go on then. That he understood very clearly the kind of discomfort. And, and I remember being amazed at how articulate both of them were on the specifics of that moment. His attitude towards women as expressed in his films. I mean, I, I can't remember any, what I would call real relationships, uh, or I, I can remember very little affection between men and women. I can remember Stella Stevens bathing Jason Robards in uh, Cable Hogue in, in, in the tub. That wasn't, to me, relational either. And, I just got the sense that you wouldn't look to Sam Peckinpah films to discover the nuances of the male-female relationship. I didn't admire Sam's attitudes towards women, um, and I was probably less articulate then than I am now in my own rejection of them. But there was never any question that it was his own personality informing his art. It was never exploitive. The attitudes towards women expressed in the picture are, are by no means clear and coherent and I think this is this is part of Sam too and it, it, it runs the gamut of 
sentimental love and attachment, the whore with the heart of gold, um, all of these rather stylized notions of women that I think were a part of Sam's life. Mother, mistress, nurse, psychiatrist, confidant, and, and working partner. I was all those things. Even when he married Joey, he didn't relinquish his hold on me from his point of view. In fact, the night of the wedding, um, I was called to see if I was safely in my room. Some women, and I've been through it in my time, but not on Sam's time, have a, have a need occasionally to be made to feel really badly. And I'm not judging it, but it's without question to me that had to be part of it. Because repeatedly, week after week after week, the level of cruelty and, and meanness was so overwhelming that you had to really want a little of it to put up with it. I mean, I've done that in my own subtle way, but not with Sam. Oh. Right, Katie? <laughs> <laughs> I can remember the meeting. I walked in and he's throwing knives at an old board that he had, a door that he had up in his, in his uh, office. And he's throwing this, this huge, Bowie knife you know, into this door, and uh, I don't know whether that was for intimidation or, or James Jones uh, Hemingway type of chest thumping or what. You know, he had a lot of that in him. Now, Sam, I must interject, used to kill time, no pun intended, on the set by throwing knives at doors, at inanimate objects, hopefully. And as a matter of fact, I, after I realized that we were breaking up a lot of the sets over a period of time, I just started always having extra doors. This particular afternoon, our discussion got heated, and he got enraged and stood up and threw the desk over. And it landed at my feet, and I got up and started to walked towards the door to my office and peripherally I saw that Sam picked up this machete, this paperweight that he had and as I was going I sensed, I suppose more than saw, that he had threw it and I remember saying a prayer to a God whose existence I wasn't sure of to not give him the satisfaction of having the machete land in the, the door and give one of those theatrical things. And it fell to the floor, and I picked it up, and I threw it to him underhand, and I said, Sam, there's some days you just can't do anything right. Katie and I can remember uh, singing this song to Sam while he was passed out in the bathtub after we carried him up to the beach. <laughs> Well, I woke up Sunday morning with no way to hold my head that didn't hurt. I think you liked that part. <laughs> the beer I had for breakfast wasn't bad, so I had one more for dessert. I know he liked that. Uh, long about 9, 9.30, the limo pulls up, and Bob Vesiglia has set his chair up out in the middle of the set. He knows that's where he's going to shoot. So the car pulls right up. And if you're off at a distance, you see an empty chair in the middle of a set. Now, the car whips in, and you have all this attendant dust, and it whips out. But there's someone now seated in the chair. Sam, like a snake, just slithered out and sat in the chair. And he'd sit for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And everybody would say, who didn't know Sam, look at him. He's creating. He's deciding what marvel. Actually, what he's trying to do is to get his heart started because he was up all night again, and he's waiting for his B1 shot. And the doctor would show up about 15 minutes later, giving 50,000 units of vitamin E, and now he's up and going. And they thought he created as he sat there. But again, if you knew Sam, he knew every shot in every sequence a year before the time came to shoot it. 
to his life was a continuous performance. He was, he was an actor. He was playing a role. He was, um, everything was, was, had that feeling about it, that somehow that every moment was being staged and that Sam was delivering dialogue created to create an effect in some sort or other. It was a very confusing way to be with someone. Because here, of course, you were being asked to play a scene in which you had no idea what the story was, and only he, only his half of the dialogue had ever been written. So it was, um, it could be very unnerving, and I think that was all part of it too. Sam enjoyed unnerving people. He would know when someone operated very well off of fear, and he'd keep that person scared to death. He'd know when someone, uh, he'd withhold an attaboy till just the right time and give that guy the attaboy and the guy would feel wonderful. Uh, he'd keep people confused. Uh, he'd keep everyone off balance. My own private theory is that Sam as a man was so off balance himself that the only way he could ever feel secure was to keep everyone more off balance than he was, which he was quite successful at for the most part. So he created an atmosphere and then he placed the actors in this atmosphere. The characters, he would have this not love of Mexico, but love of this dirty, uh, this, this, where there's 4,000 years of horse manure floating around in the air that makes you feel like you're sick half the time. And, you, it's, and Well, this was the atmosphere that he would create, and he would allow that to happen, and he would bring that on, on film. And that's why a lot of his films look so strange and so you know, weird, off balance. Whenever he started a picture, he dissembled everybody. Actors would not speak to the other actors. The crew members would not speak to each other. Just everybody walked on eggs. Once he did that, once he got you so that you were, you were like this for the picture, then he started putting you back together. And what he did very carefully, the Hammond brothers, case in point, we ate together. He saw to it. We were in the same rooms or close together. If we were going to go out at night, he saw to it that we all went together so that the Hammond became the clan. And that's what he wanted for the picture. You know, Elder, I hate to get married with one of my brothers smelling bad enough to gag a dog off a gut wagon. He now takes the Hammonds and he would start, Sam would, he would start doing things like he would say to Joel McRae, uh, that's the way you're going to do it? And Joel would say, well, yeah. Well, he said, the Hammonds told me that it looked a little faggy. And Joel saying, what? Well, OK, I, really, it's not. Let's go ahead with it. Now it's planted. And Joel doesn't like the Hammonds <laughs> at all. And then he would do it with Randy Scott. And they did it with Mariette. So that not only on screen, but at night, wherever we met, it was the Hammonds against everybody else. You notice how clannish, how cliquish we appeared to be. Blow that up by 300 times on the set with both actors, cast, producer. It didn't make any difference. Now, everybody is like that on the set. Nobody's talking. Nobody's offering suggestions. They're just sitting there waiting for the next boot to fall. And now Sam starts. and. You do something wrong, and Sam says, cut, cut. Uh, Chuck, you know, we can do. Your talent is, I mean, really, you've got to give us, I feel you want to, I know. Now you start building, and the next thing you know, the cameraman will not like, the director will not, act, I mean, the actor will not act, the prop man won't prop until they do it, and they go to Sam and they say, hmm? And Sam says, it's marvelous. It's, you know, it's practically usable. Let's do it. Now, he's taken you from total ego to total lost to back to your part of the team, and look who the team is. The team is Peck and Paul. Not you and Peck and Paul. The team is Peck and Paul. Like when Dustin Hoffman was, was, would be doing a scene and he wanted a certain look from his face, he would talk off camera. Sam would say, well, what about your wife now up there on the Scotland with your, with your, uh, with the limo driver, you know, and all this crap, and, and you know, because Dustin was supposed to be playing this guy who was jealous of 
of his wife. And, uh, and Sam says, I said, you really did that? And he said, I'd like to do that with you, too, but I'm afraid that you'd come across a can camera at me. And I said, you're a shrewd judge of character, Sam. That's exactly what I do. Don't even fucking dream of it. In a sense, when it came down to it, Sam was like any authoritarian and fundamentalist, which he transferred from the law into f making films and his artistic drive. I, I still was a preacher within an artistic setup. But in that scene with Chris Christopherson, when the lighting was fantastic, they got ready to shoot that, man. It was done with all the kind of preparation. Hours of lighting it and rehearsing it. Got ready to go, and we, and we got up, and I was marching, striding across after he had sassed me, you know. He said, kiss my ass, you know. You, you know, and, and I, I was supposed to fly into a rage and go over. Well, I went halfway across while I was shooting. Sam yelled out, and he had never done that to me. He'd always been nice and, you know, and considerate and understanding. In the middle of me, before I reached Chris Christopherson, he says, I don't believe a goddamn thing you're saying or doing, as loud as he could. Man, the, I stopped in my tracks, and nobody said a thing. Not a, it was just dead still. I was in a rage. I could see it. I mean, how dare he do this to me, you know, in front of everybody? He had poor Archie so worked up that he damn near yanked the hair out of my head. He had, and, and uh, which was better for me because uh, not being a trained actor, it was much easier for me to react to real pain than to imagine, you know, and real fear. And I looked up into Archie's eyes, man. They were black as marbles. And I said, well, he's pushed this one right over the edge, you know. Finally, I got a hold of myself, and I turned around, and I went back and sat down, and I was seething. I said, let's go. And I heard him say, I mean, like, and man, I went, I, I transmuted that rage and agony. Everything worked like clockwork. When I hit the, I wasn't supposed to hit the chair. Chris was supposed to take the fall himself. Well, I just barely got the edge of the shotgun on the edge of that chair, and it just flipped him perfectly. He went sprawling all over the floor, I went around, grabbed him by the hair, and, you know, stuck the shotgun and said, repent, you son of a bitch. You know what I mean? And when I got through and walked out past the camera, Sam says, God damn it, leaned back in his chair. His director chair fell over backwards on the chair. Burn it, he said. What he did was well, he provoked me into an insane rage, so, which is there. He must have known it, or he knew that. And he wanted more of that. Went across the street and have a drink. First is hell. It really scared Chris. And Sam was really happy with that. I mean, he really got that when boy. He was really pleased with that. But it was real. It was real. He went for the truth, and he didn't know what the truth was until he saw it. This was the case with Sam all the time. The constant sort of feeling of life imitating art, or where did one stop and where did the other begin? He called over to the cutting rooms on one occasion, I remember, um, to have us go over there and, and visit him in the house he was renting in Durango. He normally could be found at holding court from his bedroom, from the bed. And um, I went over and climbed the stairs to go and speak with Sam. And um, as I stepped through the door, there was a ear-shattering explosion, which turned out to be a, a gun being fired. <laughs> Sam was firing at the, an enormous mirror at the bottom of the bed, which, of course, was reflecting him reflecting himself. That was of no real interest to me. What was of interest to me was that somebody had just fired a gun in a room where I was standing some few feet to my left. And um, the first and only time I've ever been near a gun being, being fired, and it was also probably the only time that I ever lost my temper around Sam. But that scene, of course, crops up in the film itself. <laughs> As to Alfredo Garcia, for me, Warren really was playing Sam. And one of the odd things about that was that um, I'm not sure that Sam actually picked up on that. Or if he did, he was one of the, the last in line to do so. It became apparent to most of the rest of us earlier that um, 
that he was, uh, that this was what, it, in fact, Warren was doing, that he, on screen, was, was Warren's interpretation of Peckinpah. Hey, you shoot a lot of pistols now in the Army. The one thing he always said is, it's for the picture. And um, the end justifies any means. And when you're on a, a Sam Peckinpah picture, you, you believe that. And the people that didn't believe that really didn't stay around. So he had a group of people around him that would do just about anything to get a shot. And the shot was all important. And so there was a scene in um, opening Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid where um, Billy the Kid is out shooting a bunch of chickens. And they're all lined up and they're buried uh, up to their necks. And, and I was shooting second unit for Sam at the time. So he says my job was to go off and uh, he would shoot this way at, at Billy and, and those guys blamming away. And then that would cut together with what I shot toward the chickens, uh, which is actually blowing their heads off. So what you do is you, you bury chickens, uh, you wrap the wires around their neck and underneath the feathers you hire uh, hide a couple of squibs, and when the special effects man hits hits the button, the head flies off. Um, but the problem is that nobody anticipated was that when you get a bunch of chickens buried uh, in the sand, the weight and everything of the sand on their bodies causes them to go to sleep. So you have a bunch of chickens sitting there ready to be shot that look like this. Doesn't work, right? So how do you rectify that? How you rectify that, oh, uh, God, the karma, is... Uh, you run down the line of chickens with a can of lighter fluid and you squirt lighter fluid in their eyes and they come up like that and they look wide awake and you blow their head off. Dear Mr. Sapia, I thoroughly agree with you. It is disgusting what goes on and you must definitely have me confused with another Sam Peckinpah. I have never injured a horse or dog or surprisingly enough, a cat in any of my pictures. Nor have I ever killed chickens, scarecrows, grouse, quail, pheasant, duck, dove, pigeon, wild, of course, fish, trout, salmon, barracudas, sea bass, haddock, that I or someone in my family has not eaten. In the case of the deer, the hides and horns were always utilized. This has been the custom in my family for the past 150 years. What is your opinion on Milai? and Lieutenant Callie shooting a two-and-a-half-year-old girl in the back while she was running away. Was he hungry? Perhaps it might be a good idea and far more appropriate for you to write to the dead girl's mother. But maybe not, as I understand she was shot, too. I believe Lieutenant Callie will be out for parole in six months. I'm glad you were able to make criticisms about films you have not seen. You must have voted for Richard Nixon, whose valued judgments seem consistent with yours. Unfortunately, he is dealing with the lives of human beings. Thank you for your letter. Yours sincerely, Sam Peckinpah. I always identified with Sam. I felt uh, like a younger <laughs> version of him, but I could always see uh, uh, the same sort of the same sort of. Uh, Oh, a commitment, you know, and a, and a sense of duty that came from a certain generation of people who who had to do military service, you know, and for whom it was a fact of life, and who felt a, a duty to country. Dear Mr. President, I am working outside of the country, but I am not an expatriate. I'm an American and an ex-Marine and as such, urge you to follow through and press even further in answer to the problem, who is responsible for the massacre in My Lai? Freeing Cali even for a short time may be politically advantageous, but morally, it only serves to indicate the sickness within our country. It is not really the question of what you felt you should do, but it is what he did, and there is no way to justify the wanton killing of women and children outside of Nazi Germany. I must beg you again to consider the moral issues involved and not the political implications. Your country and mine needs a strong underlying truth. Otherwise, we are without honor of ourselves.
the high country. So many warnings to turn this old rascal around. We better heed them while we got the freedom to try. Don't forget what he reminded them of. He reminded them of a better day, which they sold out for 30 pieces of silver. Whether they did it uh, to the Japanese or corporate barons in New York or this phantom they call public taste, whatever they call it, they don't fight for a better view. I mean, who the hell would go with an empty slate to England and make straw dogs? I contacted Sam and I said, I would like him to direct it. And Sam said to me, don't you know that I'm blacklisted? Uh, and that I have a reputation for being so difficult and I just got fired off this picture and no one will make a picture with me and no one will hire me. Uh, are you sure you want to take on this burden? And I said, uh, I remember saying to him, all of those qualifications make you even more desirable to me. In terms of production problems, there was a very, very difficult problem early on. The editor came to me and he said, um, this material won't cut. I said, what are you talking about? He said, no, no, it, it, won't, it won't edit. He, he doesn't know what he's doing. I said, look, I've worked with Sam in an editing room. I've learned from Sam in the editing room. And uh, I actually learned a great deal from him in the editing process of Noon Wine. And I said, whatever may or may not ultimately be right with this film, I promise you, Everything that Sam has shot will cut. He knows exactly what he wants. And the editor, who is, who is, I'm sure, talented but very conventional, having worked for one of the knighted film directors of England, um, did the unforgivable. He called the studio, the financier, and said, this director doesn't know what he's doing, this film won't cut. As soon as I knew that, uh, I knew that I had to replace the editor. And hopefully I wanted to do it before Sam got wind of it, because then I would not only have to find a new editor, I'd probably have to find a good criminal lawyer. People used to talk about Sam um, as shooting a lot of film. It was one of the legends of Hollywood at the time. It was one of the things people liked to hear stories about, how much and how many Dale is, and how much do you have to sit and watch at night, and so forth and so on. It was a lot. Obviously, the more raw material you have, you, you increase the odds of those little nuggets that you're looking for. And that was very often the way that Sam talked about approaching scenes, about approaching the material, was look for those nuggets, look for those moments, moments he talked about a lot, look for the gold. The problem you had with him, even though he was brilliant in, in editing, was to, to get him to turn loose of something. If he shot 20 hours of film, and he only put two on the screen, he still wanted to keep 20 hours of film. He didn't understand why he had to cut it, but as a good director, pardon me, as a good editor, then he did, eventually. Uh, his editors fought him. Uh, they literally got into fights about, do we cut this or does this stay? And uh, Lou Lombardi still got, I think, scars, or I think Sam hit him with a lamp because they didn't agree on what was to be taken out. What he would do is he would, uh, he would let us all work until about 10 at night, and he would, he would call a, uh, a meeting at about 10, at which the, the other editors uh, dubbed uh, CWOT meetings, which were a complete waste of time. And uh, the amazing thing was that uh, they were anything but that. Uh, Sam would, would come around at 10 and, uh, and look at the sequence and uh, he would kind of mumble, and you had to lean in to understand what he was saying. He would speak very quietly, and it was, it was hard to understand. And he would have these brilliant ideas out of all of this kind of fog that uh, would then send the thing off into a new dimension. Memo to Tony Lawson, editor of Cross of Iron, regarding assembly of final sequence. End sequence. Take it two steps further. Start with the end sequence two reels earlier. Talk to editor about opticals and desaturation. See him by end of next week. 
freeze frames. With frozen frame, I want action, a reprise and flashback in context with growing progression. We'll take it one step further. Reprise, but not from the film and not from the horror stories. Reprise sound, flashback in sound. Talk to Murray. Start with ending. Freeze frame, reprise it, begin at beginning. Superimposed movement and the frozen frame that overlaps of two different angles of frozen frame and go into action. Then go into previous conception of the progression of the war, but make it simple. Angle of a guy turning like this and freeze. In that frozen frame, he looks the other way. So I have two different angles at what he sees. Freeze frame, then superimpose next turning. Do not want to use any atrocities except this one photo. Start. For a guy to come out of a trailer with his headband on and create that whole world of illusion, which is what he could do, there aren't too many guys that can do that. The people that can't do it, the money men, who have to hitch a ride with you, have got to hate you. You can fly and they can't. And he d didn't disguise his contempt for them. There are not really many directors who make motion pictures anymore. They are talented, they shoot schedules, but when they get through, what you basically have is an enlarged television show. Sam had figured out, and I think rightly so, that if you're going to have a motion picture, you must maintain control over everything. I think there's one person who's making a picture, and that person has to be the director. Producers are often only administrators, and they're too interested in defending their own prerogatives. I've got a temper. And I can't stand stupidity, so I'm always at war with these cats. I want control of everything, from the script to the cutting room. And if I don't get what I want from people, I put them on the bus. The trouble with producers is you can't do that to them. Everybody else comes and goes in a picture, but the producer stays to the end. The best producer is a guy who'll let you make your own movie. There aren't many around. He wanted to live in a creative space. If he could have lived in a creative space, unbothered by the studios, you know, it might have been a whole different picture of Sam coming out. Because on The Rifleman, uh, he created The Rifleman. He was a lovable kind of a guy. He, he gradually became what he was, fighting the, uh, the people that messed with his movies. He was a consummate artist. How dare you cut my film? How dare you take and cut out all the connective tissues and make it go fast-paced and put martial music behind Major Dundee. That was a great epic film. That was Moby Dick in the Desert. Any of your damn gringos fire before the signal, I swear to God, I kill you. Dear Jerry, I've seen Major Dundee. The 18 minutes you have cut disregard my strongest objections and, in my opinion, effectively destroyed my concept of the story and character development. I feel that you are not previewing Major Dundee to the public as you assured me you would when you protested the cuts and changes you felt were necessary. And relying on your own judgment, you have done a grave disservice to the people who made the picture and to the stockholders of Columbia Pictures. Major Dundee is not Gidget Goes to Mexico, but it is marked with your touch, and consequently, it is not the film the rest of us worked so hard to make and did make. You are a well poisoner, Jerry. And I damn you for it. Sam was at war with producers. Uh, he, it didn't matter whether it was a, a, you know, a producer in a white hat or a producer in a black hat. They were all black hats to him. And he just did not differentiate between them. He had to be at battle with producers. He said, Sam, are you sure you want to make this film with MGM? Because, you know, they, they really do bad things. They cut 18 days out of our film. And, uh, you know, because we were ahead, they cut it out. And they told us we had to finish. And he said, don't worry about a thing. I just bought one share of MGM stock. And if anything happens, I'll sue him. <laughs> he was very naive on many levels, as you can see, too. A director has to deal with a whole world absolutely teeming with mediocrities, jackals, hangers-on, and just plain killers. The attrition is terrific. It can kill you. The saying is that they can kill you but not eat you. Well, that's nonsense. I've had them eating on me while I was still walking around. My basic job is dealing with talent in terms of story and getting it on. I wish the rest of it were that simple. 
There's all the shit that comes before and after. Sam, because he was a paranoid type of personality, needed to invent enemies. Now, usually in the film business, you don't have to invent enemies because there are enough people who have very little else to do but interfere with, with, with the creative process. But Sam picked out his enemies uh, and then worked against them. Someone told me that um, uh, later on, after he died, he said, you know, none of us really realized but Sam actually was a classic paranoid schizophrenic. And I never heard anybody actually put it in real medical terms. And as I thought about it, I thought maybe he really was. I think the demons were fighting amongst themselves, and that was the trouble. He had, he was a battlefield. He was like um, a boxing ring. It was all smash and grab and thunder going on inside him. And it left him, I think, very little energy left to do much else. That was the most sad thing, was that you could see him drained by his own conflicts, physically drained. He was, he got very tired and uh, he got very old, much well before he should have done. My efforts to stop him drinking did succeed. Um, sometimes I wished I hadn't done it because uh, with his drinking, at least he was sober in the morning. Um, with the drugs, um, the paranoia and the aggression really um, increased dramatically. And in the morning, instead of being sober, he was just down and angry. And I often used to think, you know, the booze was the, the lesser of two evils. Well, I woke up Sunday morning with no way to hold my head that didn't hurt. I think you liked that part. <laughs> the beer I had for breakfast wasn't bad, so I had one more for dessert. I know he liked that part. And I fumbled through my closet for my clothes and found my cleanest dirty shirt. I washed my face and combed my hair, stumbled down the stairs to meet the day. It's sort of a question of what came first, the depression or the depressive chemicals, you know? Uh, one aggravates the other. If you have a tendency like Abraham Lincoln or a lot of people to be haunted by a black dog called depression, uh, you take chemicals to alleviate it. We drank so much whiskey, we drank so much mezcal, so much tequila, uh, that you end up accelerating the cycle of uh, end up making yourself more depressed by taking these depressing things, you know? And, uh, and I think that's where Sam lived. Sam always kept a gun by his bed. And one night I was, I just had my appendix out and we had this house in, in Mexico City. And um, I was in another part of the house and I got up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night and I went to the bathroom door and Sam was in, in his deep sleep, aroused by hearing someone outside. And um, he opened the door and just fired. The bullet went about two inches away from my head. I would say that he was a man who couldn't easily be employed at the time. Uh, he'd made a, had a lot of quarrels with people. He'd been uh, behaved very exotically on pictures and off pictures. He picked fights. People thought he was a drunk. Um, I think that uh, it was a rare producer that wanted to take the, on Sam Peckinpah. The cross of iron. That's when I knew he slipped. He was losing it. In the picture, we took three or four days to kill off each one of the platoon members. Anyway, we shot for four or five days, killing this particular person in the film. We got finished one day after killing him, jumped into a motorcycle and drove up to Sam's little wagon where we had our slit of bits and had a drink. We sat down and had a drink and he looked at me and he said, now Bobby, tomorrow we're going to start killing Lieutenant so-and-so. And I looked at him and I said, Sam, I said, we just spent four or five days killing that son of a bitch. And he looked at me and he said, we did? I said, yeah. He said, tell him to get me the goddamn film. I want to see what I printed. A little scary. 
the drugs were such that he was he was incapable of being the director I used to know. Uh, there was one day where we spent an entire day sitting in the caravan or the trailer um, with five cameras ready to shoot. Um, Coburn, who was doing second unit on the on the on the uh, water tower, um, me on the camera behind Ali and and Chris in the truck a handheld in the crowd, another camera on sticks, and I think the helicopter. And everybody was ready to shoot, and Sam never got out of the trailer for the entire day on some pretext that someone hadn't got their expenses or something. He wasn't going to come out until someone would get paid their expenses. It was sort of blackmailing to, to the point where I, I, I couldn't find any excuse anymore. I realized fairly early on that he was terrified of what he was doing, that he was afraid of any picture he made being compared to his reputation for the great pictures he had made. I can understand that, um, but it was almost stopping him from functioning. God, it's so easy for me to identify with Sam because I've, I've made all the same mistakes in my own life, but a lot of us blame other people for things that we don't take care of when we're screwed up, you know? And Sam would say, well, why wasn't this done, you know, when we go to the next scene and it's not ready yet? The reason it wasn't done was he didn't tell anybody to do it, or he thought he had told somebody do it and and the people weren't didn't have the people were so used to being yelled at by then that uh, I don't think that they had the initiative to go out and do something on their own whatever was the cause there was a lot of time wasted I can remember Ernest Borg named so mad one time up in the helicopter when he's flying around out there he just called down a chewed out anybody who was listening on the on the radio for a long time and then just went home he said he had had enough of this bullshit, you know. Sam and my relationship sort of really sort of got very, um, very bad. And um, one morning I was, I was in my room and I opened up my drawer and I recognized it because I remember Sam had brought it back from Japan. It was a bug and he bugged my room. Um, I was, I kept paying the bills for a room that was next door to mine and I wondered why I was paying for the next door room until I realized that in the next door room was someone sitting with a receiver. Apparently the, the bug didn't work. But when I found it, um, I was, I drove to location with Sam, I had it in my bag and in the middle of the drive Sam said, I have to go back to the hotel. And I said, we have to be on the set in five minutes Sam, we can't go back. He said, there's something in your room I have to get, it's a file. And I said, I don't think it's a file, Sam. I think it's this. And I showed him the bug. And he said, oh, damn it. He said, what I forgot was to put a funny note next to it. But he knew he'd been caught. And um, I realized that that, it, that that was the time for me to leave. I, had, I, I, I couldn't go on anymore. I don't know. I, I don't know what those other demons were, those demons that existed in his personal life while well, they had to do with his marriages and... Uh, his children and everything, but they, they didn't seem to be, uh, they seemed to be more of a fantasy. His reality seemed to be making movies, and the rest of it was fantasy. I mean, I feel the same way. I mean, the reality is when you're working, when you're making movies, that's because it is. It's a new reality. Something's being created all the time. Every day, there's something new. You see it, bang, and it's, it has never existed before. A reality. Life becomes a fantasy. You live in the house and you live in Beverly Hills or Hollywood or Sherman Oaks or wherever it is, Malibu on that. And he had that. That was his, his home was a, a, a trailer on a hill in Malibu with some, hey, I'm going to build a house here when never had enough money to build a house. That was a kind of a fantasy that he had. But he, his reality was film. When he got a film, he would prepare it, prepare it, prepare it, prepare it, until somebody said, all right, you've got to start shooting. You've got to start it, Sam. And he would, uh, Nick, uh, he would delay that as long as he could, and finally he had to start shooting. Well, then he would shoot as long as he possibly could until somebody said, that's it, you've got to stop today. And everybody was packing their trucks in the distance and going home. And I was standing alongside of Sam, as I always did. We opened up a bottle of Slimovitz. We sat down on the rails and the thing was in smoke and flames and everything else. And you could hear the trucks leaving in the background, packing the cameras and the equipment. And he turned to me and the soot and the everything else, and he said, well, now tomorrow, my first shot will be on a parallel and we'll get a long shot of this. And I turned to him and I said, Sam, 
So the picture's over. He said, I told you what my first shot tomorrow morning is. And he said, that's where it's going to be. You couldn't get the camera away from that man. And then he would, he would linger on as long as he could, and then, boom, the editorial was the same, same thing. He would edit the film and edit the film until somebody took it out of his hands, and then they'd finish the film. And he wouldn't stop editing until he got another film to do. If he got another film to do, then he would stop. He would finish it off, and he would put it together, and he'd, boom, be on to the next one. He loved to have something to do. He was always afraid. I don't know whether it's true or not, but it seemed to me that he was always afraid that uh, if he didn't start something, if he didn't have something to do, if he didn't have that, his mind placed in some creative area, he, he would kind of dissipate and he would, he, would, he would lose it in life. And his life was really making movies. Nothing is as exciting. Nothing is as exciting as being in that process. Uh, everything else is boring. Uh, and he pushed so hard that when he wasn't doing that, when he wasn't making a movie or writing, he hated writing, but he would made himself write. Um, everything else was boring, and that's when he, you know, that's, he'd just say it's... I'd ask him sometimes, you know, later in life, why do you do this crap, you know? And it's boredom. Well, I went to Mexico after convoy to begin an independent film company. I went broke, got a heart attack, found I couldn't get work as a director, and so I began writing. Uh, wrote two scripts, both were not made into pictures, and directed second unit for Don Siegel, turned down some scripts, and uh, took this one. I wrote what I considered to be a pretty duff script. And I never thought I'd hear another word about this. I just didn't think this was a very viable kind of thing. So I took my money and went away. And uh, I think probably two years later, uh, my agent called me up and said, I didn't know you wrote The Austin awesome Weekend, because I'd never actually told him <laughs> I'd written it. But he, it was announced in the trades that it was going to be made with Sam Peckinpah. And that was the first time I'd met Sam Peckinpah. And, of course, it was right at the end of his career. I think that's the last film he made. And the, the thing that struck me most uh, pronouncedly was the guy was ill. This was an ill person. This was, I mean, unwell, physically unwell. He seemed really low energy. He seemed to be husbanding his resources. And this was the first time I had witnessed Sam Peckinpah working with producers. And my opinion was that he could have these guys eating out of his hand. All he had to really do was say, I ain't going to give you a real hard time like I have given many people, and it was home free. But I think by that time it was Pavlovian, you know what I mean? The bell rang and the saliva dripped and he went for the fucking throats. <laughs> but at the end, he, he alienated just about everybody. Strange, I don't know why that was. I mean, it was uh, part of his nature to uh, put everybody up to it. I mean, he tested us all. We kept coming back for more. We... And you whooped me for it, and I deserved it. So there were certain people that took it and kept coming back, because basically we all loved Sam. You know, through all the sort of indulgences and angers and explosions, there was something about Sam that was incredibly endearing to man, woman, and beast. Um, uh, I think it was maybe the touch of the devil that made... I don't know what it was, but he was always a very generous and warm, gregarious person in one breath, and then he could become totally evil in another, and I suppose that was the attraction. I've come a ways, and I've paid a price. It cost me plenty. Maybe my sanity and at least a couple of marriages. And I'm not sure the game is worth it. Sometimes I want to say, the hell with it, and pack it in. But I can't do that. I stick or I know I'm nothing. Then I look around and notice I'm not entirely alone. There are maybe 17 of us left in the world. And we're a family. That family is composed of the cats who want to do their number and get it on. It's the only family there is. My father said it all one day. He gave me Steve Judd's greatest line in Ride the High Country. All I want is to enter my house justified. He 
he had me come out and see him, and we drove around, and he said, uh, you know, Jim, I can't trust anybody. I want you to take over my life. It was that cold turkey, you know. And I, um, I had to think about that, thinking back, I think it was about two weeks. And later, I went to Sausalito and, and saw him and uh, saw the situation, and I said, okay, I, I will. And uh, that wasn't something I was particularly apt at doing, running his business life, which was a mess. Again, we got about 30 lawsuits, unpaid bill, like a ma madness. And I had to set up an office, find everything, try to get it organized, get the lawyers going and so forth. And, and private investigators, because he was being conned by people. He had surveillance systems. The paranoia was extraordinary. In the middle of it, I, I, I'll tell you this, I, I leveled with him. I got him alone, and I said, you know, you got to stop this, Sam, and so forth. And I gave him a half an hour lecture, and he listened. The first time he would ever listen in this period, and he listened. Then he said, right, OK. Then he says, come with me. And he took me in the bathroom. <laughs> he flushed the toilet, turned on the shower, turned on all the faucets to bury the sound, and told me there are people after me, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Paranoia was, oh, it was, it was, I was laughing. I, I couldn't laugh, but he was, played it straight and so forth. And somehow we, we still communicate, but eventually it got bad and I had to, I, I had to, I, I had to quit. And he, at that point, had moved to Livingston. And um, we were still in communication, but I wasn't working anymore. Uh, but I called him up and asked to speak to Sam at the Livingston Motor Lodge, Motor Hotel. And the lady on the phone said, they can't bring him to the phone because they're wheeling him out right now. And he'd had a heart attack in the room. Fortunately, there were five nurses having their convention, <laughs> five, in the hotel. And the operator had gone and got them. They ran up there, and they really saved his life. And I flew up the next day, I remember, because it was my birthday. And uh, I walked in that little hospital and as I walked in, he's, Sam, is, I, I could see through the door. It's a very tiny little place. You know, you can go right in the front door, and you're right there in the few operating rooms. And he's shouting at this guy, I'm, gonna, I'm dying, I'm dying. You know, and he, he, cursing him like crazy. And all these buzzers went off. I just arrived. I'm looking through a crack in the door. And doctors come out of, one out of surgery and, and run in here. And uh, sure enough, they had put a pacemaker in, and it didn't work. So uh, they saved his, his life, uh, he got another pacemaker, he had two. And when he woke up, he says, I told you, you son of a bitch, <laughs> to the doctor, who he became incredible great friends with. There was a wonderful doctor up there. Guys escaping the system that happened to be really bright. But nobody knew just how bad Sam, I, I didn't know anything about drugs. I know he's on the cocaine and he's taking Qualitz. And, I, and I'm trying to find out from other parties who were the people that supplied him with these things, who you know, called themselves friends, how much he was on, because the doctor was giving him a quarter of qualude for the heart. And I'm, saying, I'm trying to tell the doctor, I said, I don't think it's going to help. And I finally convinced him, and we went over to the apartment, and got, there were more drugs in his apartment than there were in the hospital. You know, it was incredible. But they finally got it stabilized, and... Uh, when I was allowed to see him, he said, you know, there was another couple there, these so-called friends, and uh, he tried to get them to get him coke, you know, go get me some gum, and he just said, fucking silk, he won't get me anything, a son of a bitch is no good, and I just sat there. And finally, he got him out, and I walked over to the bed, and he just started the ball and gave me a hug. He's, twice, I think, he cried in my arms, but that was it. He was... Uh, even in that insane state, he knew what the bottom line was and what counted. And um, he came out of it then, and we wrote something on the rocks about Alcatraz. A lady in San Francisco was the producer and so forth. And he'd done a draft of it, and he didn't have me, because one of the principal characters was named Silk. And I kind of used to have a bitch, you know, you know. Well, I went home. I didn't promise him. I read it, and I read it. Okay. And I realized what we're doing is uh, we're, we're going back to where we were, you know, 25 years earlier. And uh, writing the same two characters, only now one of them is me and the other one's him. 
And uh, I said, yeah, okay. So I drove out back to the trailer and uh, I think we're gonna go to work. And he says, let's go. And we pick out everything and we drove to um, Point Doom Market. And he says, I'll get the meat. And I said, okay, I'll get the peanut butter and the coffee and the white bread. And we argued over the ice cream. And this is stuff we had done a thousand times, 20 years earlier or more. And we never mentioned it. We just did it. Went back and I made the coffee and then we sat down and we, he lay down and I sat down and we worked on the script for an hour. And then he, uh, I left, and while I was gone, my wife called, because my daughter had had a grandchild, first grandchild. And he talked to Lynn for about 45 minutes about yesterday, and we were going to go face our demons again and see if we could handle them. But I never saw him again. That was it. He went to Bego in Mexico and had a heart attack and came home, and I was, he was gone. When Sam died, they had this great uh, gathering of a lot of people who used to work with him that had not a funeral, but a sort of a, sort of a ceremony for him, you know, and all these old guys like Jason Robards and Luke Askew got up there and said, uh, well, this is just like a Peckinpah movie. Everybody's late and nobody knows what the fuck's going on. <laughs> Lee Marvin got up there and said, there's a, a statue in London for the RAF heroes of the Second World War. It, all it says is, I fought the battle, I stayed the course, I kept the faith. He walks off the stage. Jason Robards gets up and does a bunch of Shakespeare, you know. Anymore? They had a ceremony. I didn't go. I couldn't go. All the friends got together, but I couldn't go. Tough times. I get him now in the comic strip. If he was back here now, what would you say to him? I'd tell him to shut up that I'm coming. Couldn't really live until he's in front of that camera. I mean, he, he, was, he was lost in life as far as we all are, really, in a sense, but he was, he had such an insecurity that nobody would think that he would put such, the disappearance of the macho man and the individuality like it did in the wild bunch. And uh, to me, I don't think many people say that, but I knew him very well, and I think it was just a, such a great insecurity and unworthiness to measure up to something that had already been set by noble men. I miss his presence. I miss that enigmatic nature. I miss all of the things that he, he pushed me. He pushed me over the edge. Sam was the guy who would push you over the edge of the abyss and nine times out of ten, jump in after you. Sometimes he wouldn't. 